is a fan of also Ian Hunter and Mott the Hoople. Mm. So, yeah, if, if it wasn't Mick Ronson, it's going to be Mott the Hoople's guitarist, you know. It's going to be one of them two. I, I would like one day... <laughs> and, if, and if that happens, if I if I manage to get uh, Steve Jones on this, <laughs> on the, you, yeah. you you've got to be my co-pilot for that because uh, <laughs> I think I would like just about to have a heart attack. So yeah, <laughs> I've met him. I've, yeah, I've, no I've, doubt. Yeah, I've had a night with him. Yeah. Um, was it was it like a crazy night or was it like just yeah, well, just... he? I mean, he was very very together. Very. He came to see the prodigy when, when I was with them. It was, I guess, it could have been ninety six. He was either ninety six or ninety seven. It could have been, or oh, maybe it was ninety seven. Uh, but we played in LA, mm -hmm. and it would have been on the same night. I would have met Rob Nishida from Ibanez Guitars for the first time. Right, and Steve Jones was there at the side of the stage, and there was also Ian As. Asbury, Asbury yeah, from the cure, uh, the, no, the, cure uh, the the cult, the cult, and um, so I saw S Steve Jones, and of course, you know, see him, and it's like, wow, we you know one of my idols. So yep. <laughs> you know, he came out with us, and we were just getting led. Oh, let's go here because it's open, and you can drink here. We were going from one bar to another. Steve was just drinking water all the time. And he was saying, you know, yeah, I don't drink anymore. And uh, someone led us to some strip bar, you know. And then he goes, I don't do this anymore. I stopped doing it years ago. And I said, and I said to him, to be honest, I just want to go somewhere where we can talk, you know. But I was kind of in that situation where I needed, I felt like I needed to stay with the group, you know. And, and they were all there. And but I wish I'd just stayed with Steve and just said, look, you know, yeah, let's just, just go anywhere. Let's yeah. just go. And, because we was uh, yeah just talking about how he got that guitar sound. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, did, so so the group just sort of split, and you never really got to dig in per se. No, what happened? You know, I whilst I was doing that whole prodigy thing, I just kind of felt it was a good idea for me to stick with the rest of the band. So wherever they wherever they right, went, right, right, and there. <laughs> Um, you know, entourage. Yeah, yeah. You don't and, want to be uh, the guy going out with like all the celebrities when you know it's not part of the best band camaraderie morale thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was just, I was just trying to sort of like make a good impression to the the rest of the prodigy guys, so yeah, that yeah. I, you know, got on with these guys because there was a world of difference between me and them. You know, I, I'm still trying to figure out like how like you you've your your career span is so ridiculously storied and you you've been part of like so many uh i guess like alternative movements in whatever way you want to really sort of like cut it but like you can call back to like essentially being part of like the first wave of punk if if i if i really sort of uh, cut it that way i think you were like 16 when you hit the destructors or like you were 14. really young 14 yeah they wow. they saw me playing in my band the mm -hmm. system mm -hmm. and uh i was uh, in fact i actually put put a few gigs on and right. got the destructors to headline right. before i joined <laughs> And uh, so I was doing, I was running my band, The System, and we were just, we were young, you know, two of us were 14, one guy was 15, we were a three-piece band, and um, the Destructors, you know, I I idolised these guys, they were the big guys, they were the, they were men, yeah. you know, and um, we used to go and watch them play, and we worshipped them. And then we'd put gigs on and we'd say, look, you know, would you come and play with us? Yeah, sure. So they headlined, so they'd come down. And then, of course, all of the punk following would all come to this gig. So we'd be doing this, a gig in like a, a local, you know, not even a town, you know, more of a just kind of like a, 
a new, you know, like when you get one of these township. Right. It's not a town. Right. It's just really a load of new build houses. Just a new development. Yeah, new development. And that they might have like, you know, like a news agent, a post office, a, a supermarket, maybe a bar, yeah. one bar. And it's just, but, but masses of houses around that, you know, and uh, a community centre that serves the whole area. And they'd be, you know, this punk band would be coming down to this and all these punks, you know, like 150, 200 punks would all be coming down to this uh, community centre. And I think that those guys were impressed that I put a gig on and I was 14. And then they came to see me play in a bar in the city centre, which was more kind of where the, you know, where the punks would go to normally. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then at the end of the night, you know, the sort of... Alan, the leader of the band, he came and said, you know, do you want to join the band? Because at that time they were a four-piece. Right, right. Because you guitar. came in as a lead guitarist. Which was, yeah. uh, I think, yeah, if I, if I trace it back, I think one of the, 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 the qualities that I first heard in the English Dogs, I was like, man, whoever is playing the melodies and like the leads in this thing is like, Fucking awesome! And uh, I, that was about twenty years ago when I was reading a. It was like when I first started getting to Dark Throne, and I was like, sort of like, yeah, I, I was really sort of like trying to figure out like where the sound came from. I didn't really know that much, you know. The internet had only just really had just come out, and I was still like figuring my way through music and everything. I was about fifteen. And Fenris, I remember like just reading as many interviews as I could, and Fenris kept talking about this band called English Dogs. <laughs> and so, by by the time I started figuring out who the English Dogs were, and was like, uh, you know, getting copies of the albums and trying to find the CDs in our local CD stores and everything like that. But then when I trace it back, and and like you were part of like a punk band earlier on, and then I listened to the Destructors when. When I finally got some of that, I was like, man, this guy has like a keen sense of melody. So that's, that's, a that's always been something that I've never been able to escape. Like no matter what extremity of metal I've ever tried to listen to or be playing or whatever, <laughs> it's always come back to that. So, uh, when I learned guitar, I, I it was all about like melodies and, and everything like that. So like harmonies everything so i can attribute it back to to being very that's how that's how i sort of like first came into contact with like oh this giz butt guy is like fucking awesome <laughs> so yeah yeah well i mean i i used to think that i was pretty good and then i got a real kick in the teeth when i first heard any van halen and then i thought i've got so much i've got to learn now you know I feel like the rest of the uh, world did. I think the rest of the world was like, all right, well, I know what's going to start the fire tonight, throw your guitar into the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, before then, um, I, see, I, I remember like when I first picked up a guitar, um, my brother introduced me to Leonard Skinner, a couple of albums by then. I mean, the first mm -hmm. one pronounced. Yeah. And um, a couple of Leonard Skinner albums, and, and I just thought, Oh, this is how can guitar playing be any better than this? You know, I thought <laughs> that was it, you know. And so that's when I kind of, you know, I started to just begin to go from just playing rock and roll, just playing three chords, which I still thought that was great. There's nothing wrong with three chords. Nope. Um, nope. And just playing, you know, Beatles songs and lots of rock and roll songs. But then I wanted to just, I wanted to play more. And I had a guitar teacher for a short while and he just wanted to teach me theory, which he was really strict and he didn't teach me really, he didn't teach me any songs. He just wanted to teach me theory. Yeah. And it's like the first lesson that I had with him, um, he had me just going through this kind of like um, this, this, this kind of chord pattern, which at the time, you know, I'd never even heard Stairway to Heaven at the time. Didn't know what it was. Right. But he was trying to teach me the theory of how you construct chords and where, you know, when you see these chord names like A7 
or a major seven or something like that you know why are they called that and so he was the very first lesson he had me kind of like drawing out a fretboard map and filling in all the notes and then he had me uh, learning like you know what this chord sequence what, what it was and you know and at the time when I heard that I thought whoa I know that song that's that's an old song called Feelings. I've heard that before. This this old kind of seventies classic, you know, typical seventies yep. song that almost reminded me of, uh, you know, Brotherhood of Man or ABBA or something right. like that. <laughs> kind of middle of the road seventies. But I did like that descending chord thing. No, I did enjoy that. And um, so the lessons were pretty strict. He taught me just a bunch of really strange things, diminished chords, you know, augmented chords. There were lots of chords going on everywhere, major scale. Um, and then when I left uh, Manchester and moved to Peterborough, I was totally on my own. And, you know, because for a, you know, a new, a, a young kid, 11 years old, you're on your own because you're in a new school, you're in a new build area right. which has it's been built you know so there's hardly any people living where we lived you know right. there was just a full of people loads of houses just been built sand everywhere cement everywhere you know um building sites all over the place so i was on my own so all i had was a you know a bunch of albums you know a record player my guitar and an amp and that was it and i went you know from there and uh i just had to just kind of the music was just like yeah. you know yeah. where i was going to go i remember some guy coming around the house he was a friend of my dad's and he was just playing all this old shadow stuff you know all that old you know apache and wonderful land and all that and i remember my dad just saying something like why can't you do that you know <laughs> That's why that was and, my parents' thing too. So it was like, why can't you play the Eagles? Yeah. Like, no, no, you, you don't understand. Fight fire with fire. <laughs> exactly. And you know, so I just kept on going from one thing. Oh, I need to do that. I need to do that. And with Hendrix, I needed to, you know, I needed to figure out what Hendrix was doing. You know, I, when um, I think there was something on the TV. Of, my brother, he gave me this bootleg live at. Woodstock, and uh, so I just I wore that thing out, you know. And of course, then you just have to do it on the record player, just by just bringing the stylus back yeah. time and time. Yeah. Again. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was some kind of there was like a an hour long, two hour long program about uh, Hendrix uh, on the TV, which I videoed, and so I was able to actually watch him. So I just again I wore that out and just tried to really get into Hendrix's thing. But then, as I said, when Van Halen came along, it was like, oh, what is this? You know, but I felt like I needed a piece of that. And there were other musicians, guitar players in my town. And I would just, I would hear about these. Have you heard this guy? He's got this great vibrato. You know, he can actually do this vibrato thing. <laughs> you got, we got to go and have a look. We've got to go and check him. How does he do it? Let's see if it's real, if he really does it. Yeah, yeah. So we'd get we'd get on a bus and we'd go into town. We'd find out that he's playing somewhere with this band. We'd go and watch him, and look, he's doing it. Look, he's, he's doing that vibrato, you know. And how does he do this? And of course, you know, you'd be at home and vibrato. Then you know, you're trying to do it in this stupid Spanish guitar <laughs> stuff. But eventually, one day, you kind of figure out, no, there's another way of doing it. And then you pick the guitar up, and it's just there. It's like a twitch, you know. And so, so you guys at that point, like. Van Halen's coming out like what very late seventies. Um, yeah. Uh, you you've got, I guess like the punk movement is is sort of boiling up in England, um, and then you know you've got all the, the the classic rock that everyone knows England for. Like yeah, but we love Thin Lizzy. I mean, there were certain yeah. bands that really <clears throat> the the if, even though you know I was a big Beatles fan. Loved Leonard Skinner, but then the Beatles came. Uh, sorry, I loved the Beatles. I loved rock and roll, status quo. Um, I loved um, 
Leonard Skinner, and then punk rock came along, and it came along at the time when I needed it. So yeah. for me, yeah. punk rock, I needed that. It gave me something to really hold on to. You know, yeah. it was my, yeah. and there was a, just a, like a handful of close friends that were also into it at the same time. You know, and I felt like I was part of a group of people and we had something in common. Yeah. I mean, some, yeah. some of the first punks, you know, some of them were just kind of like, you know, for them, it was more the, the Sid Vicious kind of image, the, yeah, yeah. you know, just kind of um, rebel without a cause, really, or, right. you know, just kind of spitting at you all over the place, or just, just trying to be a bad guy, you know, just yeah. for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. Um, then there were the other ones that suddenly came along that were more kind of like people that were interested in discussion and were interested in learning about, you know, kind of like the uh, atrocities that the human race had done, and we should bear this in mind, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, yep. you know, there were people that wanted to discuss, have you heard about this, have you heard about that? And it was like a wealth of information that we'd never even considered, and the punk scene brought it, you know, to light. Whereas it didn't really seem... I love Thin Lizzy, I mean, still do, but that wasn't really going on with their topics. No, no. no. Uh, uh, Thin Lizzy, I think, were like uh, possibly the greatest uh, Desperado band, but um, definitely a world away from being punks. <laughs> yeah, but, and the, but the ironic thing is, is that Phil Linner mm-hmm. used to hang around with absolutely the London punk scene, and you know he did the Greedies, you know. Yep. Yeah. And he was very close with Malcolm Allen of the Ruts. So, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I was doing a gig at the 100 Club with the Destructors, and this guy just, he, he said to me, uh, you know, and when you have enough people telling you that you're a good guitarist, you really, when you, especially when you're 15 years old or whatever, you know, you think, well, I am, you know, obviously I must be, you know. <laughs> And then this guy says, you know, um, just because you're copying all these Hendrix licks and you just kind of think, oh, well, I'm, I must be good then. And then this guy says to you, have you, have you heard Eddie Van Halen? And I was like, no, that's an unusual name. Yes, you've got to check him out. And then next day I hear the eruption and I'm like, <laughs> I've got so far to go. <laughs> yeah. well, the, I mean, the first time I heard Van Halen, I was like, I think I'd heard like Metallica and Guns N' Roses at that point, and I was just like, "How, how does that guy exist? And how does anyone, how does anyone want to play guitar if they can't do what he does?" <laughs> it's like you know, I was I was really young, and I was just like, it just seemed pointless because like that guy has all the notes, and we have like three. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with three, nothing but wrong. um. Yeah, I mean, later on you kind of figure it out, but it's all part of the growing thing. And, uh, you know, when in the English Dogs, um, we were having a great time. And, and I'd say at the very, very beginning, pre-English Dogs, you know, um, it was kind of Motorhead, Iron Maiden, and, uh, you know, just some of those bands were kind of, they were taking punk in a more sort of, metal inspired direction yeah because uh, um, you, know. you came you came in after the porky men album yeah, um, yeah. And, and that album was was much more you know gbh yeah yeah it, probably even a little more melodic than gbh in if you ask me right but but then like you know forward into battle uh was the first one that that you did but like that one is a serious metal kick, and and I I wonder like how like in the Destructors you know that was that was a straight punk band yeah but then where did these metal where did these metal riffs like literally just explode out of did you bring them in or was it like a band sort of decision well, or it was all going on. Uh, um... It was around that time, it was like 1982, 1983, you know, I mean, Motorhead were a very big deal, and well, but they were a big deal in 79, you know, 
It's bomber. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there was a lot of kind of, I don't know, there was just like when you was, you'd pick up your guitar and you'd, you'd just kind of like, it was just the beginning of all that kind of like realising that you could dig in and get this palm muted thing and then yeah. you could access these chords. And, you know, you just, it was the beginning of all that kind of thing. And, you know, to, to be honest, I kind of think that band, I think UK subs were doing it a little bit on the first album, you know, it was, and the damned were doing it on machine gun etiquette a little bit as well. Just here and there, mm -hmm. it was, it was kind of growing here and there. I feel like Discharge was also doing it on, like, I think the more I see sort of, like, came out oh, uh, oh, that, yeah. around that that time, and it was just like, you know, and that's right. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was a growing thing. It was, it was happening, and it, and I think part of it was, it was, it was like almost growing on its own. It was, it was happening. In lo lots of little pockets all over the place, and um, you know, for us it was just, I guess it was, um, the you know, we we I needed to just kind of take it into this. I was like practicing and trying all these things out, and whenever I was doing it, it made me feel relaxed. It just made me feel, you know, I didn't feel anxious. I I, just, I could just spend an hour, two hours, three hours. And try and do something that, for me, at that time was new. Because if you don't bother to try anything, you can churn things out for sure. Yeah, but yeah. it's it's when you sit on your own for an hour, you give yourself an hour of time, and you, during the course of that hour, new things come out. You know yeah. what they are, new ideas. And you know when you're in that, you feel very relaxed. You feel very safe. It's a good feeling. You know, and you're being creative. And and I just felt. I've got to start putting this creative urge into the music. Some of the destructive stuff was going in that direction. We had a song called Electronic Church that was very, very kind of motorheady. And um, we had a song called Nerve Gas, and that had that kind of like, that kind of, so that was kind of going there, you know. And with um, Electronic Church, that had a, so the metal rhythms were creeping in, and and I just, I just think it's everything, one thing after another. It just keeps feeding it until yeah. eventually you feel like you've got to use it. And um, we, in the Destructors, there were there were a couple of guys in the band. It was a good band, good fun, good songs. I think great lyrics, and um, we had a really good following as well. You know, it was it was something else. We had the biggest following in in my little area where we live. You know, mm. we could do a gig in front of regularly every time, three hundred people, which might not seem much, and but when you come from a small yeah, town, that's a lot with an emerging weird sound. You know, it's like still back then. Yeah. I'm sure people were like, "What the hell is this noise?" You know. So. Yeah, it, it was very good. And so we'd have lots of bands booking us to play with them because they knew that we always got this 300 people coming out all yeah. the time. But the thing was, is that, you know, when you're going through this mind of like, you know, I'm kind of I'm coming up with these ideas and I want to use them. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the, you've got a couple of other guys in the band that just don't seem to be, then they can't do it or they, right. they won't do it. Right. And they can't. And then part of you says, you know, I've, I feel like I'm, I need something else, you know. So then that's when I formed the Desecrators. And with the Desecrators, I, I had some friends that were much more into American hardcore, you know, uh, right. bad brains. Yeah. And, um, and with them guys, I felt like I could do, we could do more. We could yeah. do a bit more. Yeah. So, but, so did, but, like, and, did the American stuff, like, creep into like influencing you like was black flag on your radar at that point or was yeah, that too american yeah yeah no absolutely yeah but it was you know it was that kind of like again a lot of it comes down to that thing where you, you spend so many hours just kind of like on your own just playing and you're being very creative and you just want to use that creativity yeah yeah if you find other friends, especially because these friends were more my age as well, so that was right. that 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 helped a bit, you know. Yeah. So these guys, we, we were all the same age basically. So in the Desecrators, when we did that, 
and you know we were going around each other's houses and you know we were listening to the same records like you know, say black flag and um so we get the damaged album or something and you know we think yeah you know this is uh greg Jin, you know he's doing this kind of anti-guitar thing but we love that i mean that whole era god it was so exciting i mean um religious vomit you know god what a great song dead kennedys you know i mean the, 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 there were certain albums that came out that even now you could pull them albums out and every single song yeah was a great song there's yeah. so many of them you know yeah. it was a good <laughs> i i i always wish that i had been born like in 70 like the, the late 60s because i wish that i could have uh, experienced that era as opposed to mm. The, ni the 90s, which I mostly grew up in, because <laughs> so, yeah. it, it just sounds like a like a world of uh, just all of all of like Black Sabbath and Thin Lizzy had like sort of run its course, and it's like what what now? And then you know your country was like spitting everything out. So like there was the punk thing happening, but then there was also like the new wave of British heavy metal, which you know, yeah. like. Like, I, I can't even imagine, like, how exciting that would have been to have been, like, you know, reaching your mid to late teens and just, like, all this stuff, like, Diamond Head coming out and just hearing that for yeah. the first time. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, again, you see, we were kind of rubbing shoulders with those guys as well. We've, not Diamond Head, but with, mm -hmm. with like, the young heavy metal guys. Yeah, yeah. Because it was that age, 17. Yeah. Uh, so the, so the seven, it was when I was 17 that I joined the English Dogs. Yeah. And, and that age, I was doing what, you know, most kind of 17-year-old males do, and I was going out and buying a motorbike, you know. And, yeah. And then I was hanging around with other guys that had motorbikes, and, you know, they, they essentially listened to the new wave of British heavy metal. Yeah. So we were sitting together and we were drinking and listening to music, you know, and they were playing their music. And, you know, I could hear the great guitar playing, you know, so I was saying, yeah, this is this is really cool, you know. But then I was playing them some of my music and they they got some of that. When I played them the English Dogs, when I played them uh, to the ends of the Earth 12 inch, they all really liked it, you know. And I, had, I introduced them to Metallica and wow. Slayer. So <laughs> I heard I heard Metallica and Slayer before all those wow. guys, you know, right. and I think that I wouldn't say again that was another thing. There were pockets of people in the UK that came across that, you know, like the Bay Area thrash, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exodus. There were pockets of us that came across that because we actually, when I first heard all that stuff, I thought that they had kind of somehow. We were crossing very similar. I thought they were punk bands. Yeah, I just thought well. that they were, they were just doing it way better than what we were. You know, I just, <laughs> but at the same time, we always had the argument because we always sort of said, "Yeah, but listen, their lyrics, oh, the lyrics are no good." You know, we were always saying that all the time. Yeah. yeah. But uh, just, but musically, we we were very envious of them. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. I, I mean, like uh, at that time, are you hearing the stuff through? Like, are you? tape trading through that time or is it more so like someone got like a copy of kill em all or someone got a copy of the demo tape trading and I, I would say that probably one of the main people that was responsible was digby pearson of earache records okay and so you like digby was in in the mix with around you guys yeah early on yeah yeah um i had the desecrators and we had a guy in the band. There were certain people that were real drivers of the scene. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I, and generally, these people would travel. So they would go from one town to another, and they'd be going to gigs, and they would be socialising and hanging out. You know, they'd be going around people's houses and smoking pot, and, you know, they'd be getting to hear a lot of new music first. Yeah. 
because the people that traveled were the ones that picked it up and brought it back to the towns, you know. So we had a um, like one of these guys in our town called Mark Massey. And he was like my best friend, but he was a he was a bit older than me. And he had the same guitar. He had that same Ibanez guitar that I used to use. That, you know, I still got one. <laughs> and he had the same one. And he was also in the Desecrators. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I used to give him guitar lessons. And he rode a motorbike. You know, so you can imagine we were real best friends. He was like a bit of a big brother, really. And um, so he was the guy that would go traveling to Nottingham and to London and to Kings Lynn and to Cambridge and to Ipswich. And he'd go traveling around, you know. And then, he was, I think, one of the first people that kind of became close with Digby Pearson and then came back and bought this tape of Metallica and Slayer and wow. Exciter. And that was the beginning. And I think that then, me, what happened then, I believe, is that Digby booked the Desecrators to play in Nottingham and we supported Toxic Reasons. And... Me and Digby stayed in touch, and he'd just send me loads of one thing after another. Soon that he was really right on the, you know, centre of all this new music. I mean, that only goes to show with the the bedrock empire that Eric has. You know, it's like whatever happens to that label in the future it doesn't even matter at this point because he was on such a cutting edge that he found he found the the true basis of everything extreme and like Eric was like the powerhouse for when extreme metal like really just just exploded and uh that only goes to show I didn't know that backstory but he was that prolific so yeah he really was you know, when, as soon as we found all this stuff, and as I said, when we first heard it, we thought they were punk bands. Yeah. Um, but they were just, you know, somehow they, they they were just musically, they were ahead of us. But, you know, we had no money. Yeah. We, yeah. we managed with, with what we had. Like the gear that you've got there, you know, well, I've got, I've got some over there. Yeah. and But, you know, those kind of things, it's just like, we could what we had really it's funny actually when you think about it now because we had no money so we'd, we'd go out and we'd look in the back pages of melody maker for sale oh <laughs> yeah. no there's a there. oh it's, it's only 120 pounds mm-hmm. it's london let's go and get it yeah so if if only i still had that one now it's one of the first master volumes you know <gasps> yeah i wish i still had <laughs> someone stole it but um but then that Marshall that I had was, you know, compared to other people's was like a piece of shit because, you know, theirs had, oh, we've got this new built-in game, you know, and yeah. I had to use first boxes. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. you, you've managed with what you had, and I think that's what Easily. was part of the spirit. Yeah. It, and, and it so, produ- so so through, through that time, like, you hear Metallica and Slayer emerge, um, I think I've seen like photos of like somewhere around the Master of Puppets era, somewhere around the Justice era, perhaps, of Metallica and their friends and like a, a, a couple of the dudes and like the prolific dudes in like the Bay Area that like were like, you know, sort of like in their entourage slash crew like wearing English dog shirts. And yeah. I think it, I think in one interview that I read somewhere around, I don't know, ten years ago. Um, that they dropped in on the session. Yeah. That you guys like, like, how did that even happen? And like, well, this, um, the English dogs got to the point. You know, we we we'd done to the ends of the earth twelve inch. Yeah. Which we were very happy with. Um, still pretty happy with it now. You know, we only did it. We did it in two days. Wow. And um. It was rough, but it really had a good vibe, felt great. And um, shortly after that, you know, we we did a lot of rehearsal and we played whenever we could. We had a good London following and um, we eventually uh, we, we recorded the album Forward Into Battle. Uh, when we did that one, 
it's because of like, what we were, were and who we were, we had no money, all this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we were very much kind of isolated and just whenever we came up with an idea, we would just try and figure out how we can use it, how we can put that idea in. And some of the ideas were coming from, you know, classical music or something like that, because we'd hear, oh, I might hear something like that person's inspired by uh, Mazurski or something like that, you know. And actually, when I was really young, uh, my grandparents had a load of Russian classical music in the house. Um, so I'd hear like Rachmaninoff and uh, Rimsky Korsakov and stuff like that, you know. So these melodies were banging around my head. Yeah. And so I'd kind of like think, I probably had more of that going on in, in me than the blues at that time. The, the, my blues really came from Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And but I had a load of these kind of Russian melodies going on, and I wanted to put them in somehow. Mm -hmm. And at that time, with with the English Dogs, at that time, it felt like a vehicle to be able to sort of do all this stuff. So we did the album um, Forward into Battle. That was quite adventurous. You know, it was a real mixture of new wave of British heavy metal, punk rock, American hardcore, lots of influences from classical stuff. Then we did the Nightmare of Reality 12-inch. Then after that, we did Where Legend Began. We were massive, massive Metallica fans. We, we went to the States. We fought into battle, much to our surprise, did really well over in the States. We didn't know this was going on. And we got a phone call from a guy called Gary Tovar up over in Los Angeles, and he had some agency called Golden Voice. And he said, wow. you're, pop you're popular here right now. You need to come over and talk. And we said, you know, yes, please, you know, America. Oh, God, you know, you got 18 years old and we're thinking to ourselves, this is it. We've, you know, we're going to go to America. We're going to go. So we gave up our jobs. and You know, we all had these crappy jobs at the time. I was working in some double glazing place. Um, I went to college for three years, came out, you know, I got this qualification, but all I wanted was money. So I just went, worked in a double glazing place. Uh, place just so I could get some cash you know and then we went to the states and did this tour when we were there we when we played in San Francisco and we bumped into Kirk Hammett's brother who was running a fanzine and I've, I've I've got the words metal mania going on in my head I don't know if that's right maybe I've got crossed wires but I think that he was running a fanzine I think it was called metal mania or it was connected with metal mania anyway so he says to us hey Metallica, they're, they're fans of you. You know, they like your stuff. And we said, no, no you're, you're, you're kidding. You know, said, no, no, they're fans of your stuff. And I was like, we were thinking, this is Metallica. They're talking about Metallica, you know. So anyway, we went back home. And, you know, by now we were already on Music for Nations, which was we'd, we'd done forward into battle. We walked into the offices of Music for Nations and said, hi, we're the English Dogs. Would be any chance that you would give us a record deal? And they said, yeah. Wow. And so we just thought, fucking hell, because we wanted to be on the same label as Metallica. Yeah, so I was, I was about to say, I think the English distribution for Ride the Lightning and Master of yeah. Bands was Music for Nations in, in the yeah. UK, right? That's right. Yeah. So we walked into the offices, we'd got on the label, and then we'd done this American tour, and we'd met a few people that were very important. We'd, we'd played with um, Heathen. We'd played with a very early lineup of Heathen. Wow. So, so I'd met Lee Altus for the first time, because mm -hmm. he was 16 then. So you know, we, we walked into this venue, there's Lee Altus playing with Heathen, Everyone's saying, oh, you're Giz Buck from England, yeah, English Dogs, yeah. You know, well, you need to check out. We've, we've got this guy called Lee Altus. He's he's our guy, you know. He's in and I, Exodus right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've seen him play a so, few times then. <laughs> so I remember, like, everyone's warning me, saying, you know, you, this is like, he's our best guitarist right now, you know. And I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, no, here we go. And sure enough, he came on and he was absolutely amazing, you know, no doubt about it. And then we went on and we did our thing. 
<laughs> the electricity turned off, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of sabotage there. <laughs> but at the end of the gig, you know, I met Lee. We got on really well, you know, and that was it. We'd stayed friends ever since then, you know. And um, But anyway, yeah, came home, put into the studio to record Where Legend Began. And bear in mind, all along, we've never had a manager. We've had a, people that have helped us, but, but not real ma not managers. Yeah. We've never had a producer. Wow, we don't okay. really know what we're doing at all. <laughs> we're very enthusiastic. We've got lots of ideas. And we just keep trying to use all the ideas. But we really don't know. We don't know how to get the sounds. We don't know really how to... We've just got loads so of ideas. You, you don't even have an engineer at that point? Are you guys like putting the mics in front of the cabinets? No, no, no we've got an engineer, but okay. he doesn't know how to get the sound yeah. that we've yeah. got in our heads. Got got so it. we're walking into a studio and saying, hello, you know, yeah, we've got, we want to record an album, yeah, and we really like Metallica, but we've got this engineer that might work, he might work with Phil Collins. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> He doesn't know how to get that sound. We don't know how to get that sound. There's no one around that's helping us. So we, no one knows what they're doing. We've just, all we know is we've got these ideas and we've got to somehow put them down, you know? And um, so, but anyway, we're in the studio and we're getting on with our job and everything's going okay. And then we have a phone call from Music for Nations, from Mark Palmer. He phones us at the studio and he says, Metallica are in town and they uh, they want to meet up with you. So they didn't come to the studio because we were in the studio. I don't think they wanted to disturb us at the studio, they, but they wanted to meet us and they wanted to go to a, you know, a typical classic English pub. So we met, we met at one by the studio, you know, so um, and, and this was it. I was thinking to myself, well, we're going to meet Metallica. And then uh, we were in this bar and we were having a beer and we look out the window and there they are, you know, they come up. And I, I'm just kind of thinking, well, I just, how many questions can I get in in this small <laughs> amount? You know, the thing that was really, I was talking to Kirk Hammett, but I was, I really, really was dying to talk to James Hetfield because I just wanted to say to him, James, how the hell do you get that guitar sound? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and... Of course, the problem is when you're in a situation like that and you've had a few beers, you know, you're over, you're over excited. Oh, you can't take, you can't take everything in. You know, we didn't have our iPhones with our notes, notepad on there. Yeah, so, yeah. oh, what was that? You know, oh, it was an Ibanez tube screamer, was it? Oh, it was a rap pedal, was it? Oh, it was a, you know, we didn't know really, you know, it was, we were very overexcited, but what really excited us was they just reeled off song after song of ours that they liked. That's amazing. The, the, Those guys were true fans of like the crossover. Like and yeah. the the best thing ever. Uh, because in, in in somewhere in the last decade I became like really good friends with Ross Halfman <laughs> well, uh, of all of all people. And um um but like looking back at all that era and the depth of like like where the hell did you find that like weird obscure UK punk band t shirt that you're wearing while you're like carrying the flag of of this new heavy metal movement? I was I was always like transfixed by the juxtaposition because it was like super structured metal that way, but coming from like loving the misfits or the english dogs or like discharge and every um yeah. gbh shirts everything like that and so it's it's been it's been really cool to see that they were like you know even as they were soaring like they just couldn't do anything wrong through that time that they were still had their ear to the ground enough to even hear the, the english dogs and call you guys out to a bar it was uh Hearing all this, hearing them quote song titles of songs that, you know, that I'd written, you know, that we'd all written, you know, just, we just couldn't believe what we were hearing. We just thought, you know, <laughs> that it's great. It, it, it was good to be appreciated 
Um, and yeah, it, that that really did make a an impression on us. But then we went back to their hotel, and uh, they said, "Well, you know, let's get some beers, go up into the room." Of course, they weren't used to being with really poor English guys, so like you know. <laughs> We just had to say to them, oh, we've got a bit of a problem with that. You know, we haven't actually got any money, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, and then we said, yeah, we haven't got any money to buy beers, but, we, you know, we've got a load of, we've got a load of uh, weed, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and they were like, oh, we don't do that, you know. But Cliff Burton says, yeah, well, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we said, well, let's go up into the room and we'll, you know, we'll have a joint, you know. So we went up into the room. And, uh, you know, we're sharing stories and laughing, you know. There's been some ridiculous photograph that had been in Kerrang! magazine of the English dogs with our faces popping out of this kind of red card that had been sliced. It looked ridiculous. And Metallica were looking at this picture, but they were pissing themselves, so, <laughs> you know, uh, we were. And I was trying to play them the roots, mm-hmm. and I had a cassette on me, and I was like, desperate for them to, to hear you know you should check this band out you know they're a massive influence of mine but they didn't really get it you know they couldn't quite you know i was trying to kind of like say to them look you know the way how they do some of their riffs you know with the palm muting it's like you know it's not a million miles away from what we're doing here you know it's quite close because for me what metallica had was this that their their use of palm muting you know that that whole that way how they did it they were one of the first ones you know to do that um yeah there. yeah it's the way how they use their palm music i just thought it was very clever and i was trying to say to them that there had been a punk band that was using palm muting in a kind of very clever way that kind of thing and you know that yeah. kind of very clever usage of palm muting yeah. and um, but I don't think they were quite getting it you know sometimes you need to be in a different situation for people to really hear things yeah know? yeah I'm sure with like beer and weed floating around it probably wasn't the most conducive <laughs> environment no we we had this little game there was a thing that we do at parties at that time where we'd get a person to just kind of you know lie down with their feet stretched out on the floor you know like <laughs> this and you know they'd have their back we we kind of if you can imagine they cliff burton basically on the floor like like this uh-huh. <laughs> like in, on the floor like this yep and we're all pressing down on his head okay like so there's Five of us, just the English guys. Well, I don't know. Maybe everyone else joined in. Maybe Kirk Hammett joined in and Lars could have done. Not Lars, James. Lars wasn't there. Right. And we were all pushing down on, on Cliff Burton's head. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. after one minute of pushing down, and Cliff, Cliff's like, you know, trying to stay rigid, stop his neck from snapping. <laughs> and then we we'll get two fingers and put them underneath him. And we lifted him right oh, up to the trick. Seat. Because it's a trick. You just use one finger or yeah, two yeah. fingers. And if everyone does it at the same time, after doing this pushing down, yeah. the yeah. person becomes weightless. We we um, had tricks like that in high school too. I remember we, it was like this this one thing. It was all about like this mental thing that you had. Couldn't do it yeah. first, but then on the second go, everyone... Sh- yeah. Like- well, when, we, when we did it with Cliff, mm-hmm. we were so over, we'd done it, too much and he banged his head right on the ceiling <laughs> and we were laughing like fuck but then we all got thrown out because you know the hotel we've been getting complaints and right. the hotel manager came in the room and he threw us out and but you know we'd had that special time with cliff burton so. absolutely that's amazing yeah. that's amazing and and uh, from all accounts he was uh, one of the biggest sweethearts and so that that an, another another cliff story uh, that I I dare say not that many people know. So I hope, yeah. more, I hope more people hear about this. So just hearing hearing more and more cliff stories, what is always amazing. And to take to take it like um, 
uh, to strafe to the side in something relatable. Uh, we're both friends with John from Baroness. And, yeah. Um, um, so it was it was ten years ago actually the Baroness opened for Metallica here in Australia, and uh, I uh, didn't know John at the time, but through a mutual friend we got introduced and they were like hey you should hang out with our friend Nate and um, so basically Metallica were playing three nights here and Baroness were opening those three nights and doing an off show um, on the day off and uh, so on the first night I go and I'm like hanging out Baroness like my favorite band at the time and so I'm getting to know John and uh, at the end of the, at, after their set, um, the band splits, but me and John and the bassist, Summer, at the time, uh, were just hanging back. And I'm like, how come we're not going with the rest of the band? Like, they, they, seem, they sound like they're going out to, like, you know, the bars and the clubs to, like, hang out and everything like that. What, what are we still doing here? Because I'm just thinking, like, that my, at that point in time, like, there's no way that, like, Metallica will come and talk to us. They've probably got like eight limos to catch and you know, like gold to count. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so um, John's like, look, man, let's let's just hang out and see what happens. Like, I kind of got a bucket list. <laughs> and uh, uh, um, next thing, like the show ends, Lars appears out of a door somewhere and goes like, Hey, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? And John's just like, Oh, just hanging out. And I'm like, you know, just hanging out with John. He's like, Oh, come into our, our, our room. So we, we go into like this, um, communal, like eating area that has all the best food from the town in this like circle around this table in the middle. That's just like a big dinner table. Kirk's in there. And <clears throat> basically, uh, someone makes an apple bong, <laughs> an apple bong goes around the table, but just a really, really sweet story that Kirk sort of brings up. He's like, he turns to John after like, there's some banter going on, but he turns to John and goes, you know what, man, if Cliff Burton had have heard the, the album that you guys are currently um, you know, touring on, yeah, uh, which was the Blue Album. He's like, he, he's like, that is essentially in my mind what Cliff wanted us to do after Master of Puppets because we were just yeah. trying to figure out how to be heavy, and we got that. We got the speed. We were trying to figure out like how to do the weighty thing with like the thing that that should not be like the big chunky slow stuff. Yeah, yeah. So we were figuring that out. And then we, 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 we got the melody. We like, we figured out harmonies and the melody and like, and, and what you guys did on the blue record is essentially, I think what he would have wanted Metallica to have like gone to, because it was so, there was such a basis of like heaviness, but it was all intertwined around yeah. harmony and melody. And, and I just remember like turning to John, cause I'm just like taking this in. I turned on to John and I could see like this kind of twinkle in his eyes because like he's a huge Metallica fan just like you and I. So, so ju just to put a, another cool story out there. That's a good one. That yeah, and with like the prodigy, that there would have been like a serious amount of money sort of flowing through that you would have possibly been able to like just go nuts on the guitar by. Now let's just have a think. It's a good job that you that you've reminded me actually, because you've made me think. Oh, where where are they? Here we go. Here we go. So so you know, of course, you you have to have one of these. Look at that. You, you You've got to have one of these. Yeah, yeah. I, you know what? I've got, I've got John Baisley's Gibson Les Paul custom. Oh right, yeah. Yeah. It's it's his so, it's his Sunburst custom. Did he? What did he sell you it? Did he give you it? 
he basically gave me it after the crash. You know how I did that big charity? Uh, well, yeah. not charity, but like the auction, like that that I when I first met you. Yeah. I, I moved to New York um, for a few years at, at that time, and so um, he lives in Philly, and he he was uh, he brought it up to me um, one time, and I was just like in awe. And so uh, I took out the um, the black hardwo- uh, the black plastics on it, and I put all the cream surrounds and stuff yeah. like that, like on yours. And uh, yeah. let me see if I can pull it out now. <laughs> Have you got it there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It's like the heaviest thing on earth. <laughs> At home. I like a bit of weight. That looks great. Yeah. it's. Uh, did, this, did this guitar, would it have played on the... Um, this well, on let's the... let's get them to introduce <laughs> them to each other. I'm a me, me relative. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this this one recorded, a, I think, a bunch of like the rhythm tracks on the Blue Record. Uh, and that is such a fine album. Oh, I love it. It's it's like one yeah. of my it's in my pantheon of like just like greatest albums. So, but that's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Is, there, is there a story behind that standard? Well, you know, it's I just spent a long time trying to find the right one. You know, because um, because there's so many sort of like uh, years, aren't they? Where I mean, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the 1980. You know, like the heritage. Yeah. Yeah, yep. but they're a bit more money. I did come across one in a there's a there's an old store in San Francisco which has got a you know it's an old guitar shop that I think that a lot of the you know a lot of the big guys take their guitars there to be serviced and um, and looked after. So that it's a long standing old shop, and I and I went in there. Uh, they've got a lot of second hand guitars, and I went in there about two years ago and they had a heritage in there and I just picked that up and I said, is it okay if I just play this, you know? And <laughs> so I thought, yeah, great. And I loved that guitar. And, um, so I was, I spent a long time researching what years are, are good years and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I'd had a, I had a bunch of guitar pupils and they, you know, a bunch of them had Les Pauls as well. And so, through them, I was kind of like trying their guitars and de- trying to decide which ones of theirs that I liked, you know. And I've got my guitar luthier, who's like, he's got his workshop right next door to my studio, and he's a, such a massive Les Paul fanatic, and he's got a heritage. Right. So he was trying to help me find the right one. So, I mean, this is a. Uh, I remember whether it's a 2014 or something like that, but. You know, yeah, it's, it came along and it's it's fantastic, yeah, and it, it's, it's just I've just spent a long time trying to find. And this one, basically, I use it really. I use it in the studio, and yeah. I use it for certain parts in the studio. But I don't use it live so much because mm-hmm. one, when I did use it live, I found that it was just because I'm always so used to having twenty four frets. You see? Yeah, yeah. And like and that, that's cut out a little more, I think, towards the neck. Yeah, uh, towards, but it's, towards the body. Sorry. Well, I, re- I mean, this guitar is is a beautiful guitar, yeah. and uh, but it has it. It's definitely got a. If you check out the album, the Jane Stark album, Great Adventure Cigar. Mm-hmm. And if you hear some of the guitar tones on that album, yeah. There's a lot of that album that is recorded with. I had, essentially I use on that album I use a for most of the tracks a '59 Les Paul, right? Which which belonged to the producer Terry Thomas, and that used to belong to Mick Jones of Foreigner. Wow! Oh, it's that one. Oh, yeah, I've heard that, of that. I've heard of that one. It doesn't that one have like a crazy name of some sort? I don't know, but but I used that, and at that time I also had this. And I still got it. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. Now I did. 
I did. This is just a very cheap Les Paul studio, even cheaper for me. This only cost me four hundred pounds. But the, they're amazing. The, there's no this, there's no tonal difference. It's like it's just it's just oh, aesthetic at that point. These pickups are as hot as hell. They really they're yeah. beautiful. These pickups are yeah. so virtually. Most of the album was recorded using, a, not not this, because obviously it's not 59, that's a 2014, 2000, I think it's 2014, or 2016. Um, and um, th this one, but that sounds exactly like that Les, that 59 Les Paul, it sounds just yeah, like it. Because that one's, that one's got the, um, that one will have burst bucket pickups in it of 57 yeah. classics, which is, which are exactly akin to the 59 but the, yeah. the studio will have what this one has which is the 498t and the 490r which are the super hot like more hot modern pickles. sounding ones yeah because this yeah, more like a seymour duncan jb i think they've got quite a lot of yeah you know like, yeah if you I measured think, them yeah i think the jb came out and then gibson was still doing like more like you know the classics of what they're known for and the T top may have just come out, which is like basically the thin Lizzy humbucker sound. But then, like once the JB came out, they did this thing called the 498T, which became it. It's it usually comes in all the Les Paul traditionals and all the Gibson SG standards. Really? Yeah, and it used to come in the Les Paul standard, but once once they started perfecting those 57 classics and the burst buckers, which are much more like 59 pickups, they started putting yeah. those in all in everything. But I I like I like a little more sizzle that's in these. Uh, yeah, all they're, they're these, awesome. All of these SGs have 498Ts in them too, so yeah, I need a little now, more sizzle. <laughs> now you're making me think because. <laughs> I mean, my this guitar records. You know, when I use it in Jaina Stark for the recording, I, I do some of the songs using this. Some of them. Yeah. This one virtually appears on nearly every single song. Yeah. Because it just sounds absolutely amazing, but its perfect double tracking partner is this one. Now this guitar has been this has been with me since ninety seven and it's recorded on every single thing that I've done since then. And uh Did you record then, anything with the Prodigy or were you just like straight live guitarist? You know what I did? I, I went into a studio because I in fact I went round Liam's house one time and uh with the intention of just playing a load of ideas that I had. Mm -hmm. And I took every piece of equipment that I had at uh, that time, I just put it in a van and drove it to his house. <laughs> and I had a, a Marshall stack, you know. And he was like, oh, no, you can keep that in the van. I'm not interested in that. And I had a load of rack mounts. And he said, no, bring the rack mounts in. I want to hear what they've got, you know. Right. So I, I left this beautiful Marshall in the, in the van and took these rack mounts in. And this, the strangest, I just could not believe this happening. Um, these rec mounts sounded good anyway. I, I knew they were good. I used them at home, you know. I used them in my own studio. They sounded great. And they had lots of good, unusual sounds programmed into them, you know. Yeah. So, took them into the studio. And it was almost as if their power had been just sapped. Is right. what, Whatever was going on in Liam's studio just seemed to, like... I would say, like, not even, not even half the power, a like quarter of the amount of power. I remember being puzzled, like, why is it sounding so weak? Mm -hmm. you, I, I couldn't explain what was going on. There have been times when I've gone into someone's studio set, set up, and they seem to have some kind of whatever that's going on in there, like noise suppression that is beyond belief you know where it literally just saps the power out of all of your equipment and of course how can i question this guy you know yeah i'm in his hand you know i can't say to him no, this gear is great there's something wrong with your equipment <laughs> <laughs> but obviously there was yeah yeah so he's looking at me saying why does it sound so shit and i'm like well 
it was all right at home. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the <laughs> well, worst. You know, it's, it's that famous one, isn't it? Oh, you know, it was packed last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sounded good. <laughs> no, I was like, sure it did, buddy. There's 30 people here tonight, but it was packed last night. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that didn't work. So then what I did was instead I, I went home and I recorded a load of stuff on my own and I gave him like a dat tape full of ideas. Mm-hmm. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I've got it, kids. Yeah, yeah, I'll have a listen to it. And then eventually me and a guy called Chris Needs, he's a journalist, a yep. uh, very well-known British rock journalist, very well-known, very close to the Rolling Stones and The Clash, really good friends with all those guys. And I went into the studio with him and we recorded this track, which was like a really, like a really metallic version of Fuel My Fire, which the Prodigy did a version of. So I went into the studio with him and then came out and he gave it to, to Liam. And then when I heard the album, it was just really strange. When I heard the album, The Fat of the Land, there was a load of samples of my guitar that had just been taken off that track and just sort of dispersed around the album in a really wow. unusual places, you know. Wow. So, I mean, Did you get really, credit for that? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but it's, it's, I can only get like, you know, PPL sort yeah, of yeah. royalty. Yeah, yeah. My so, family. but you know, even that's been helpful. Yeah, know. yeah. But but that that's that's kind of weird and cool and probably speaks to the prodigy's weird nature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that like it wouldn't just be a straight guitar part; it'd just be like somehow like chopped and yeah, put all over the place with like all the echoes and cavern noises. <laughs> Yeah, that's. <clears throat> there was one time when I went in there and, and he said to me, oh, I've been working on another idea. And he'd taken, you know, some riff out of a Blur song. I mean, Blur is a band that I really, I cannot stand Blur. Oh my God. But they, they, <laughs> yeah, well, they, but, um, they did one song called Beetle Bomb, which was like a... Like that at the beginning, just a really well, he'd taken that and he'd made something out of it, and it was, I'd say, pretty fucking cool. So, but nothing ever happened with it. But, but it was so typical of him, he would just get instead, you could go in with the greatest riff in the world, he wouldn't use it, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. But I guess one of the questions that that then springs to mind is like, like. Thinking about um, like th- there was a, a destructors um, someone magically with like a, a really awesome video camera at the time like you know shooting one of your shows where you guys are playing on like the back of a flatbed truck in a field your head oh, yeah. fully charged and everything fast forward through English Dogs um, and then I think you were in like a couple of other bands like you you might have m- one of the most storied band lists of all time but where does the prodigy come in and swoop you up and like what frame of mind are you in at that point like you've been part of the punk movement you've been part of the metal movement you've had all these like cool things and then like uh music sort of like explodes in a weird way in the 90s and all these things start crossing and melding and you know like god flush starts but then sort of opens this gate to, towards like stuff like the Prodigy or, or, or whatever else happens and how do you get drafted into the Prodigy? It was around this time, that was like 95, so I'd reformed the English Dogs uh, at some point in the early 90s, it must have been about 94. Um, I had a band called War Dance, and, and uh, we were kind of like a mix of hardcore and thrash metal. And that had done something and then fizzled out. And then I had another band after that called Sundance, and that had done the same, fizzled out. And then I decided that I wanted to go full on heavy rock, you know? And, I, and I, me and a few friends, we formed a band 
And we got in touch with Pinch. We got, I started going to Grantham and going and visiting Pinch again. Uh, he'd been in, he'd been in a couple of different bands, and I think that he was quite keen on the idea of me and him hooking up again, because right. things hadn't worked out for him musically, things hadn't worked out for me musically, so it felt good me and him get back together and try and do something. And at that time, you know, we were just really kind of getting into more of that sort of heavy rock sort of vibe. Um, we were both going to places in like Nottingham Rock City, which is just a very well-known rock night where you'd go, you know, every weekend. And so we formed a band and that was called Monkey Jungle. And it was basically, you know, a heavy rock band. And uh, we got ourselves, you know, quite a decent following. We were regularly playing the originals, just all originals. And we were doing these horrible gigs, you know, where we were playing in these kind of like holiday resorts in the UK, you know, like uh, <laughs> and things like that. But but the this gig that we were playing was one of these awful kind of like a it's just a night where there's loads and loads of new sort of unsigned bands, basically unsigned band night. But it was in a Butlins holiday camp, and um, Mora, the journalist very close friend of uh, Lemmy and you know just a well-known punk guy he was there reviewing the gig it was just a coincidence but he used to be a massive fan of the English dogs so he he was out from from way back mm -hmm. and he saw he saw me and Pinch in this heavy rock band and he just basically said what, what are you doing you know mm -hmm. why don't you try and reform the English dogs you know what are you doing this for and he he reviewed the gig and he reviewed us and he said, so much talent is going to waste in this band, wow. you know. Uh, and we read it and we thought, well, yeah, maybe we, should, <laughs> maybe we should jack this in and try and reform the English dogs. So that's exactly what we fucking did. We just, we just, Mora, because he was our friend from the past mm -hmm. and he just suddenly came forward and said, yeah, what are you doing? You made us think, and we were like, yeah, what are we doing? <laughs> so we then decided to reform the English dogs, and all the time he was kind of there. I think he was trying to guide us or mentor us a little bit, trying to help us, encourage. Yeah. And we've got the original lineup back, but you know, it's, it's never that easy when you get people that you haven't played or met for 10 years and you bring them together again, everyone's life could have really drastically changed, you know. Yeah, I think it lasted for about four or five gigs and then we were already, you know, recruiting new guys, you know. Right. <laughs> and then eventually, it, me and Pinch, we had a new bassist and we were a three-piece with yeah. me singing. It had almost become what I was doing with the system before the Destructors, you know. But it was the English Dogs, but a three-piece with me vocals. And uh, we did this album called All the World's a Rage. And I think that we were starting to really find a good sound. Uh, Morat loved it. He was in Kerrang! magazine, he was saying, listening to English Dog new demo tapes. And he was listening, naming the songs from our new demo tapes. He was really championing this our version of the English dogs and I was going down to London all the time because I was trying to get a break for the band I was trying to get the English dogs more gigs maybe we could get on a you know a, a record label that would be more you know driving mm -hmm. and um, we were on a German record label at the time and then me and Morat would be you know I'd, I'd come home I'd phone Morat up you know He'd give me suggestions. I was just trying everything I could, you know. I was, I was trying, kind of like managing the band, I guess, at the time. And then one day he phoned me up and goes, he goes, Giz, I've got, um, there's a really big band and they, they're looking for a guitarist and I've put your name forward. Wow. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> he goes, uh, he goes, are you busy? <laughs> I said, well, he goes, uh, 
I think you'd be really good. I keep thinking about you doing this. So I said, okay, yeah. yeah. And he goes, I can't tell you the name. They're going to phone you. And then you'll know. So, okay. And then a couple of days later, I get a phone call. All right. Yeah. Is that Giz? Yeah. You know, um, I've been recommended to you by Mora. I said, yeah. Um, he says, do you know who it is? And I says, no. And he goes, well, I'm Keith Flynn. And this is the, uh, of the band The Prodigy. And I was like, fucking hell. <laughs> so, and he said, yeah, we've been recommended you. So, um, and I've been told loads of good things about you. And I, and I, I just want you in. And he says, but unfortunately, um, I think you're going to have to have an audition because I think the manager's kind of de demanding that we do it fair and we, we audition people. And I said, right, okay, you know. And then Mo Rapp phoned me up and he goes, right, you know, is Keith phoned you? And I said, yeah. He goes, he goes Giz, you, you've got to get this. You're going to get this. You've got to get it. <laughs> and I said, well, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah, of course. I know I've got to get it. How am I going to get it? And he yeah. goes, I don't know. You just do whatever it takes, you know. And I, and, uh, I was trying to think, well, what's it going to take, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, I think at the time... You know, I used to have long dreadlocks, and I think I'd already cut them all off anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was already kind of going onto this route, you know, of having more of my old punk rock image. Yeah. And I was already spiking my hair up again. Mm -hmm. But this time I thought, fuck it, you know, bleach my hair again. I'll go blonde again, you know. I think I might have even gone red. I might have dyed it red. And then I thought, well, fuck it, they've all got piercings you know so i'll go and get my nose pierced and all this you know whatever and then i just decided to get get my guitar and i think at that time i was playing at that time ah, well it was i don't i don't know if it was this one i uh, know i know which one it is it's here it's definitely this awesome so this was the guitar that I had just before I joined the Prodigy, and I used it with them for the first, you know, maybe the first few months. This is, this is the one that, like, won you the uh, audition? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So, so it's an SG. old, it's a cheap SG. I an love it. like the SG Studios. SG, uh, SG Special, I think Yeah, it's yeah, the Special, sorry. <laughs> they're, they're awesome. With a, with a broken string. The last time that this came out was probably about eight years ago or something like that, you know. Wow. I need to put some new strings on it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it needs... It, Every now and again, I'm, it's uh, you, you just have to remind yourself every now and again, you've just got to bring out these old guitars, polish them up, put a new set of strings on and give them a, a bit of a play and just Absolutely. remind them that it's still loved. Yeah, because that, that thing looks awesome. Like, uh, the other guitarist in my band has one exactly like that. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's, I think that's got like a flat red paint job, whereas his has got like yeah. a translucent one. You can sort of see through it. So, You're right. It's definitely yeah. It's just that that looks cool because I think they were doing those in like the mid, early to mid '90s, and I've always wanted one of those. Well, this because obviously these pickups are a little bit. I don't know what pickups are in there, but they they're different to the ones because I've got a '61 custom reissue. Yep. Ooh, like a I, white one. A, a what? Is it a white one? No. Is that what you? Is yours a custom reissue? This this is a yeah a sixteen no, no, the, the the SG oh, the SG oh, sorry the the SG no no that's that's a twenty fourteen SG standard and the the red one is a nineteen ninety five SG standard right okay so so in here I've got the one I got later on. Once I've got the job in the Prodigy, I have, <laughs> and you can, you I have can the guys from <laughs> I have the guy from Gibson coming over and shaking hands, you know. Yeah. So I ended up getting this beauty. 
Oh my god! Look at that. Oh, this is a really, this is a really beautiful guitar. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, SGs, I still use them where I can on the recordings. Yeah. But this beauty. That's I was this, say, like you always keep going back to the, uh, to the. This one. It's this blue thing. This thing sounds like a cross between. A Les Paul and a Flying V. It's got that Flying V kind of mid-range honk. Yep, yep. Because because oh. the the Flying Vs and the Explorers had the 500T pickup in it, which was a ceramic pickup, and that thing is like crazy hot. And uh, that that custom SG right there that, that you're pointing away right now, that will have oh. uh, the 57 Classics or the Burst Buckets in it. So. It'll uh, it'll sound a little less subdued, uh, yeah. a little more subdued rather. Um, and then your your old one will have the four ninety R pickup in it, which is like Next. yeah, which is like halfway between the fifty set like the fifty nine sounding pickup and this this hot one. So it's like a halfway point. Right. So, yeah, that's an amazing guitar collection you have. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you. Um... Anyway, so when I got the job with the Prodigy, mm -hmm. um, so I had to do the audition, and I just really, I, I, that guitar, I wore it, like, from waking up to going to bed, I was just, you know, I had a, um, I was playing the Prodigy around the house, and I was just leaping around the house and just playing the stuff. And I was trying to think of how, what am I going to play to this stuff? And I was coming up with my own guitar lines. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my, inside the percussion of the Prodigy songs, I could, after a while, I could actually hear the, the percussion, percussion was kind of creating notes. Yeah, yeah. And I could, I could hear, I could make sense, and I, my, my head was starting to turn them into guitar riffs. Yeah. So I was able to go into the audition knowing 100% what I should play. And so w when I went in, I, I played these riffs, and they just, they just said, yeah, you know. And we never thought anyone could interpret it like that, you know. So That's they were really yeah. happy about it. And um, so when I came home, you know, I was obviously nervous, thinking, God, you know, what's going to happen? But, yeah, we got a phone call in the evening saying, yeah, you've got the job. So then, that's amazing. Then I ended up being with the Prodigy for three years. But as I said, it was a. I was in a totally different world with them because you know, my background that I'd come from, they were nothing like that. And culturally, we were different. You know, yeah. I'd come from a, a working class northern background. Yeah, they yeah. were they were from Essex. Yeah. Which was, yeah. and they were the whole thing with Essex people is they're very much kind of um, trying to sort of like their their culture over there is you know keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah, you know if you buy a if you buy that Les Paul if you come home and show them that Les Paul they'll somehow next time you see them they'll have three you know <laughs> they'll. Have, They'll have three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you, you'll pull out your Mesa Boogie triple rectifier. They'll, the next minute, they they own the company. You yeah, know, yeah. it's just, they were very, that whole thing with Essex is always very, if you buy a motorbike, they've got to get one that's better than yours. You know, that's, the culture is like that. Because if, 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 if I'm right, Essex is, uh, is just south of London. It's east. East. Okay. 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 And it's ever so slightly north. Right. Very slight northeast. Right. Just a yeah. But so it's, and it's, it's just enough that it's like a train journey in, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, very middle class, uh, very wannabe middle class sort of place, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And as I said, you know, it's all very, you know. Very plastic. Yeah, yeah. I, there's there's a, there's a few towns that I could uh, attribute it to. <laughs> That's I, for imagine, sure. 
I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds uh, akin to Orange County in California. So, um, and really, that, that's I'd say that that is it. I mean, I did, unfortunately, because I wanted to be accepted, so I found myself molding myself, changing myself. Really, I shouldn't have done that. But I did because I wanted to be accepted by this group of people and I wanted to feel, I wanted them to trust me so that I could become part of a team. I wanted to be a team player. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be part of the band. I wanted to be part of the writing. I wanted to be part of what was going on. Right. And but, so was that like a whole political process that you never sort of like, did you always feel like on the outer edges of what the real like centrifuge was? Yeah. I mean, the, the person that I hung around with the most in the band was Leroy, you know, the six foot seven and a half inch black guy, the dancer. Mm -hmm. He was my best friend in the band, really. Yeah. Uh, um, but essentially, they were all from Essex. They're different. They, we, we're just so different. Yeah, yeah. And and I think that I couldn't do any. In some respects, I couldn't do anything right. You know, I yeah. couldn't because because I am what I am. I'd come from that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I've. I'd come from a background where, you know, we all get in a transit van and we put our marshals in there and we travel from Peterborough to Berlin and we've we've just got a shitty van and we, we make the seats out of the marshal cabs. Yep. You know, totally, totally a pill, you know, and we just, we, no one's got a sat nav, no one's got a map, but somehow we get there, you yeah, know, yeah. and the other... And we crash out the night in someone's farm or whatever, and all everyone cares about is getting drunk and smiling and having fun and parties, and yeah. we don't care if we're uncomfortable, you know? But where with the Prodigy, it was like, oh, it's so different. <laughs> but, you know, that kind of, then that rubbed off onto me, and then I started kind of, you know, well, why, you know, I'd start getting impatient with people and because... You know, that's what goes on in that world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, once you start going up the upper echelon tier of uh, the pop world and just, you know, limos, and I'm sure you <laughs> probably did a few private jets. Yeah. So yeah, it, can, it can go to your head. It, it, it can easily yeah. go to your head. <laughs> yeah, it can. And, you know, so when the prodigy ended... You know, I, I had a quite a long journey ride coming back down again. Yeah, yeah. So, but but did, did the did the prodigy end or did you leave? I don't really know that much about the prodigy's like sort of chronological well, history. I was offered a contract, mm -hmm. and I just I just couldn't sign it. And I was very glad. I was put in this situation where you know it was like either sign it or you're going to get fired. Yeah, yeah. You know, this this contract was very, very. It was saying, look, you know, if you do a gig with the band, you do the gig, you keep your mouth shut, you don't ask for anything more. You come off stage, and when anyone asks you anything about the gig, you say nothing. You know, yeah, yeah. and if you get guitar companies coming up and offering you something, no, it goes through us. If they want to give you a guitar, we get the guitar. You know, wow. if if you get an amp company, you know we get the amp. We'll decide what you have out of this. You know that's ours. Yeah, you're not you're not allowed to tell people that you're in the prodigy. You're not allowed to tell people that you're doing that gig, that gig. You, you sh shut your mouth. You know. I, I can see why you walked. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, you know, this is, you know, I don't like this. I don't, you know, you're treating me like, you know, like I'm a commodity. Yeah, absolutely. So. So I decided that I couldn't sign it, and then I got given my marching orders. Wow. Yeah. And so, like, I, I think, like, as as the 90s ended, I remember, like, the, the prodigy sort of, at least at least in, in my general awareness, like, faded out a lot, because I, I was, think I was, like, 10 through 12 through 13 or so when the prodigy was, like, exploding. And, right. Uh, I remember, like, the Prodigy would, would always, well, not always, but, like, uh, one of the big 
festivals that everyone would talk about, like every January was the big day out, or like uh, things well, like that. Yet. Yeah, and so like I think the Prodigy played that a couple of times, and you guys were like yeah. the main draw. Yeah, I, pl I played that with them in um, 97 and 98. Yeah, and I think I think I was at both of those big day outs. So I have I have seen you I have seen you play this is the first time that I'm thinking about this. I've seen you play yeah. before I even knew who the English dogs were. Yeah. <laughs> so um Yeah, I mean we played with Soundgarden. Yeah, I mean I can't even God. imagine the amount of like cool bands that you were like rubbing shoulders with at that time like Soundgarden would have been something uh, yeah. Alice in Chains might have been out of the picture at that point you know I loved Alice in Chains I still I think do I went to go and see I do I went to go and see them um, when Lane Staley was in the band and that was fantastic yeah. and then I went to go and see them What's the name of the singer that replaced Lane Staley? Uh, William Duval. Yeah, and he's great as well. Yeah, yeah, he's and he's awesome. I mean, like you can tell that I, as as much as I'll give props to Lane, it's Jerry's band and it's Jerry's writing and it's his lyrics and it's his vocal melodies still and it's like, it you know, as talented as Lane was, like it's still Alice in Chains right now. There's no draw yeah. off. <laughs> Really? So, yeah. So, sorry, you went, on, you went and saw them? Check on Brain? Is that the... Uh, yeah? check, check My Brain. Check My That's Brain. That's it. From, from uh, uh, Black Gives Way to Blue. That's such a great like song. One of the greatest riffs. Oh, I mean, that riff. Oh, it's literally I'm, like... I, I just <laughs> love that. This is so good. I think there was one day when I just kind of, um, I was making fun of one of my friends, and I was because you know we've got like a, a, a guy in the band in Jaina Stark called Simon, mm -hmm. uh, and he's he's a lovely, lovely man. But we tease him a little bit, you know. We yeah. kind of like, you know the you know the Beatles song, you know Revolution Number no. Nine. Yeah. We say we basically we say that that's the sound that's permanently on rotation in his head. You know, he he just walks around with spirals in his eyes. You yeah. know, it just he's just one of these guys that he's like a kind of happy-go-lucky, but also slightly kind of, you know, he's he's a little out there. He's a little out there. I love the way you put that, mate. I was trying to think. I didn't want to say anything derogatory. He's a no, little out no, there. No. But, but I, I put that aside. I said, Simon. I said, look, this. This is the sound. This this is probably what's going on inside your head right now. And put check my brain on uh -huh. <laughs> with that demented riff, you yeah. know. And he goes, I mean, everyone got it, you know, because yeah. it's just it's like the sound of insanity. It's it, great. It really is, and it's got it's got all the hallmarks of both Tony Iommi and Jerry Cantrell, and something else in there. And when I think that was like the lead single that they put out when they came back. Yeah. And I was just like, great, it's just going to be Alice in Chains sounding like all the Alice in Chains ripoff bands that came through the, the 90s and the 2000s. This is going to be terrible. I'm sure it's going to be mm -hmm. terrible. And they came out with that, and I was just like, oh my God, they sound like a doom yeah. band. They're like, yeah. they're like <laughs> three keys lower, and, and like yeah. everything's just like 10. Like that, yeah. I thought they were yeah. gonna do like an acoustic album or some cheesy crap, you know. It's just a lot of my punk mates, they can't, you know, they won't get it why I'm so into them, you know. And I, and I just sort of like, I just accept some people, you know, it's just like, look, you know, there's a I can hear a beauty in that sound, you know, you can't hear it, I can, yeah. but you know, I, I tell you the other song that that reminds me of a little bit, um, now. One of the songs that I, I'm not really a fan of Pantera, but I, I appreciate like some of the things that they did. Yeah. And one one of the things that I do appreciate is the riff of Walk. You know yeah. that. Okay. So now that that's, riff. That's it. 
Okay, so that. Um, It's that thing. It's that. It's it's the blues in that bend, which yeah. hits everyone's heartstrings because it's just the way that it is. It's like the blues was the universal language, and it doesn't yeah. need to be anything that even sounds blues. But if you bend the string in that way, it's like oh, I'm home. It sounds like someone's talking to me. It sounds like someone's relating to me. So you've totally got it. I mean, I think that again when. After I'd grown up a little bit, you know, and kind of, I think that it was great when I did that album with the English Dogs before the Prodigy. We were we were finding something there, and then when the Prodigy happened, I had a chance to sort of like get some creative stuff down with Jane and Stark, yeah. and that album, The Great Adventure Cigar. I'm, you know, I'm. Um, I was very, very happy with that album. I, I felt like, you know, twenty years on after that, I was still playing that album and thinking, damn, this is the best thing I've ever done. You know, and uh, how can I ever get back there again and try and do something like that again? You know, yeah. I didn't think it was ever going to happen again because that particular album, I felt like. I'd, I'd kind of what I was trying to do with songwriting. I've never really had the chance to do it before. With the English Dogs, I loved everything that I did, but ultimately, I'd joined a band. Yeah. So, you know, when you join a band, you kind of still have to adhere to yeah the democratic process. Or the leader, you know, whoever the yeah. leader is, you know, they've got the final say or, you know, but when it's your band. So, I mean, like, one, for instance, one of the things that did happen a lot in the English Dogs, but I guess this is what helped create the strange individuality of the band, especially when we did, you know, forward into battle, you know, to the ends of the earth, forward into battle, nightmare of reality and uh, where legend began. I would write a song. Mm -hmm bring it to the band, especially in the later time, not in for, not in forwarding the battle and to the ends of the earth, but when we did Nightmare of Reality and when we did Where Legend Began, I would write a song, bring it to the band, and Pinch would pretty much say, well, want to use that part of the song. Yeah. But I don't, I don't want to use the intro and I don't want to use the main, you know, whatever, the chorus. I want to use that part. Yeah. So I was constantly writing songs but having to just take snapshots out yeah <laughs> and, you, and and so what was happening was a lot of what i felt was a complete song and you know bear in mind when you've got an intro and a verse and it builds up to something and you've got this riff and it's built its way there and what yeah. comes out of that riff is also important but when you're suddenly getting these riffs and you're just you're constructing a new song from yeah. a load of bits that are just taken out of your songs that creates something that's very compromised, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas with Jaina Stark, it was like, no, this is my thing. And, you know, when that song comes in, it's saying what I want it to say. And it's saying it all the way through, mm -hmm. right from beginning to all the choruses, to the solo, to the end, you know. And yeah. I needed that. No, uh, that's, that's super important. I think that if your band has got an identity, if mm -hmm. it's got a particular sound that it works towards that you're trying to create and you know you you're not trying to you don't want to sound like a cover band you know you want to sound you've got a sound and you've got a defined when you go in wikipedia you put the band description whatever it is yes. and your band follows that description you're not trying to do a bit of everything a jack of all trades yeah <laughs> identity yeah you know and if like one of the other guys in the band writes a song and it also follows that identity. I'm good. You know, we'll use your song, you know, yeah, yeah. and I'll help, I'll help you kind of, I'll help um, arrange it for you, but I won't change anything. We'll use your song and we'll arrange it. So it totally sounds like a Jaina Stark song, you know, and I will do that, you know, Yeah, yeah. but, but I won't, if someone, if I bring a song into the band and if someone says, I don't like that part of the song, you know, I'll say, well, I'm sorry, but you know, we, we're going to use it, you know, yeah, because, yeah. 
because it's in the song and it's all the whole thing is a picture. Yeah. But look at me, look at me for me, that doesn't happen in Jane and Stark. In Jane and Stark, everyone in the band says, you know, every idea that I bring in, they all say, you know, we like all these ideas, you yeah. know. They all yeah. they all say you know, nothing's wrong here. No, there's nothing wrong, you know. That's, that's cool. That's cool. Well, yeah, everything I mean, just works like that. Which is, which everyone, is great. everyone in the band just, you know, we're best friends for a start. We really respect each other. Um, everyone, like the bassist, Simon, he was a fan of the Destructors. He was a fan of the Desecrators, English Dogs, you know. Awesome. Our drummer, Fozzy, he's like me, you know. He's like a huge Beatles fan. Yeah. Mass, you know, we've played together since 2005 in basically a Beatles tribute band. You know? <laughs> He's a huge Beatles fan, and but he really, really loves, you know, like Led Zepp, and you, you know, like British classic rock. He loves that, yeah. and I've kind of introduced him really to punk, and now he's just on this new thing, you know. I mean, he was, he was like a massive Rush fan as well. Really loved Rush, but and I got into Rush late. You know, I, I discovered them much, but when I discovered them, oh my God, it was like, oh, I'm in a supermarket. <laughs> you know? this, this is, that, that's one of the, the, the most interesting, unique aspects about you. Um, I just come from a world where I grew up in like, when punk and metal were already an established thing, they were, you know, in whatever ways had become commercialized and, you know, household names. Um, and uh people people who are into both genres have a tendency to be uh narrow-minded i guess whereas you can see the brilliance in everything like just thinking about the dudes who looked who looked like you did back in 82 the, the idea that, that like dudes who have fully charged hair would ever even have the ability to get into 2112 or moving pictures and stuff like that yeah. or then appreciate something like Alice in Chains or like 20 years on still be even like remotely interested in hearing this band called Baroness play their like sludgy melodic thing and like even have a, like an interest in it so like I, I just I've always thought that that's like that's such a really cool thing that you're always like following like the cutting edges still of music which i think is really important and I'm luckily i'm lucky enough to be introduced to stuff i mean that's kind of what it is i mean with baroness um when the english dogs reformed in 2012 2011 2012 and we reformed to do a tour um which was a very very good tour where basically we just played the forward into battle album mm -hmm. Back, back to back and to the ends of the earth and when I was on that tour we two guys uh, twins Craig and Ryan um, they introduced me to the sound of Baroness but um, because I remember them when as soon as I heard Baroness you know I, I thought oh my god you know it's like it's like everything in one band, you know. <laughs> Essentially. I mean, I became so excited about them. And so as soon as they came over here, I was like, I was like hitting about three or four gigs, you know. And they were doing some small shows that were really cool. And I was getting them to sign all the vinyls. I mean, I've got yeah. like so many signed vinyls. Yeah, yeah. I've got... <laughs> two copies of every one, one that I've opened up and played and the other one that's still sealed with the signatures on, that's you know. Awesome. And I've got different lineups, different people. Yep. And, uh, of course, there was the big major, there was the coach crash, you yep. know. Um, it, and, God, I really wish that coach accident hadn't, hadn't happened uh, because I really loved absolutely. what happened before, you know. Be, when I saw them just a few days before that, I was going to say, like, you probably saw them just a, not too long before that happened, or maybe one of the shows that you were going to go see got cancelled. I can't remember. I, they may have been headed somewhere else at that point, but... God. I saw them... I think it was... I think it was Minehead. 
something like this. It was one of these small coastal towns. Mm -hmm. I'd already seen them in London. Yeah. And I saw them at this, like this small coast. I'm sure it was Minehead. Really unusual place for Baroness to play, but here they were. Yeah. And it was a great, and, and yeah, I felt very close to them because it was such an unusual place. Yeah, yeah. And after the gig, we were hanging out, and yeah, it was it was good. And then, like a couple of days after that, I was on holiday with the family, and then we got the news that the the coach had gone over. Yeah. And, um, yeah, God, that was such a shock. But um, so, so we've been doing this for about close to two hours now, and I don't want to take all your time, and it's probably like real late there. Yeah. Uh, I do I do want to ask a question um, because GBH and Discharge are such huge, huge bands in my pantheon. Do you have any cool stories of either band or both bands <laughs> that, you well, could, that you could take us out with? Mainly, mainly GBH, really. Okay. Yeah, because although, we, you know, we do have stories of Discharge, but the GBH stories are the ones that you want to hear, really, because <laughs> right. they are really good fun. Okay. Um, listen, GBH, I got into them when they very first came out. I was one of the first fans in my area where, where, where I live of GBH. And in where I live in Peterborough, we've got um, a passport office. We've got one of the two main passport offices in the country. Mm -hmm. And it's in Peterborough. And, um, you know, I was a fan of GBH. They'd only just come out. I was in the Destructors. And we had this bar in Peterborough called the Golden Fleece. And it was where all the punk bands played. The Destructors used to almost have a residence there, you know. And uh, anyway, one day, this is really strange when I think back to it. My parents didn't used to have a phone. They didn't even have a fucking telephone. And anyway, I was around my girlfriend's house and she had a telephone. And my friend, he phoned me because I said, look, if you need to get a message to me, just phone me around my girlfriend's. So he phoned me up around my girlfriend's and he said, kid, I've just seen GBH in town. And I was like, no. And he goes, you've got to get into town. GBH are in Peterborough. And wow. he, what he was trying to say was they were actually spotted walking around town. Yeah, yeah. So I got on my, I think I, I was 16, I think I was on my little s small 50cc sports motorbike thing, <laughs> went into town and I went looking around for them and then, sure enough, there they were, GBH were there. And I just said, all right, you know, how are you doing? You know, it's kids of the destruction. You go, all right, mate, how are you doing? I said, what are you doing here? And they're like, well, we had to go to the passport office. And, and they said, um, we're going to go and get the train back. Do you want to come with us? And, and went to the train station. So I got to the train station and they're, they're sat there, you know, and they're going, you know, is there anything going on in Peterborough tonight? And I said, yeah, there's a gig on at the Golden Fleece, you know, we, that place where we always play. And goes, oh, well, maybe we can get a train back tomorrow then. Let's come, let's go out. And I said, yeah, that, let's, let's do it. So we went to the Golden Fleece, you know, and uh, there was some band playing and, you know, these two, not all of GBH, two guys of GBH, mm -hmm. Ross and Nick, they were there. And, you know, everyone's really excited because we've got two guys of GBH in our pub, you know. And um, anyway, so I had a word with the band and I said, look, you know, um, can we borrow your instruments, you know, and and, can, and I got on the drums and, and I think we did a couple of GBH songs. Wow. Because <laughs> no one knew any of their songs apart from me, you know, so... Yeah. But one guy knew the words to Big Women. <laughs> so we did Big Women with GBH. So we had Jock on the guitar, Ross on the bass, and I was playing the drums and someone else was singing, and we did Big Women. And then later on, you know, anyway, what and one thing led to another, and the Destructors got on to our support in GBH. Oh, that's amazing. I was like, fuck me, I am in my element here. We are doing a 30 date tour with GBH, right? And this was it. You know, I was let, you know, you can just imagine I was, it was like, 
I was just so in my element, having such a good time. We did a gig in Birmingham with GBH. Bear in mind, it's their hometown. Yeah. And it was a huge gig. And we were playing to, you know, a couple of thousand people every gig. And anyway... A couple of thousand people? Yeah, it was really, really happening at Insane. this time. It was exploding. Insane. UK 82. Yeah, That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. It was 82. Wow. It was... It was an absolute explosion. And um, so there was a load of people ligging backstage, loads of, and when I say backstage, it was a hall because we were playing in like a massive, massive hall that had been partitioned. And uh, it was probably the NEC. Mm-hmm. And then, anyway, so I, there was loads and loads of people all ligging, hanging out, you know, and there was a lot of record company people. And I just thought, you know, I thought I need to, uh, I need to try and sort of do a little bit of a prank here, you know. So what I did, what I did was I went to the toilet and I did a turd and I caught <laughs> and I caught it in the with a toilet tissue paper in my hand and I, and I got this big turd like this and I just went out to this crowd of people and I just threw it up right in the middle of the air and, and it just came down in the middle of them and I don't know, who knows? Who knows where it landed? I don't know. But anyway, at the end of the night, everyone's leaving. Everyone's leaving there. And I look down, I can see this turd in the middle of the hall. You know? And the next night we had a gig with them in Ipswich. Uh-huh. And I th- you know, I thought, well, you know, this turd joke is kind of like, you know, it's, it's working really well, you know. So we had this gig and we, the Destructors are playing with GBH and also with Blitz and the Abrasive Wheels. We're all playing together. And uh, anyway, I, I run to the toilet in the dressing room and I, no- I noticed that the light didn't work on the fucking, <laughs> in the toilet. So I did a turd. But I, <laughs> but I didn't hear any splash, and I think, what's going on? <laughs> so I opened the door to take a look, and I'd accidentally shat on the back of the toilet seat. <laughs> and I, just, I thought it was quite entertaining, because this thing looked like an enormous pyramid, you know, yeah, yeah. a monolith. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, this could be entertaining. So I shut the door, <laughs> and then... The, the, the girlfriend of the lead singer came in there and goes, oh, I'm bursting for a piss. And I said, the toilet's over there, you know. And anyway, she went in and she came out and she goes, someone's done a fucking great big shit on that toilet seat. And, you know, anyway, so I thought, you know, the joke must go on. So I got this turd and went downstairs to the abrasive wheels dressing room and I believe that they were sharing their room with Blitz and I open up the door and one of them is crimping his hair in front of the mirror and in front of in front of him there's a sink <laughs> so I threw this turd into the sink whilst he's crimping his hair he's just crimping it looking in the mirror and this turd lands in a sink in front of him right you know, we're all really howling with laughter and we go away, we do our gig, and we get drunk, you know, and we come off. And at the very end of the night, someone said, hey, Giz, have you checked your guitar case? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so I opened it up to find, sitting next to my, the neck oh, of my own head, my own turd. <laughs> <laughs> someone have smushed it in there? Oh, I mean, it was. It hadn't been smooth. It was still solid. It was just sad. It was just light. It was just sad. <laughs> and the, the funny thing, the bus driver, he was just sat in a chair. This quite an old guy, you know, really sick. He'd be in isolation right now. <laughs> He'd be high risk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he just sat there, like you know, with his bus driving hat, you know. And here's me on the floor opening up this case with dread. You know, what have they done? And I open it up and there's my perfectly formed turd just sitting next to my guitar. And and <laughs> he looks in it and just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I could uh, I could only imagine he probably would have just been like, "What the actual fuck are these kids doing?" That's that's an absolutely amazing story. <laughs> and and if 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 uh, if anything was to really sum up uh, UK eighty two era punk, that's probably it. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's, thrown into GBH dressing room. That's amazing. Well, thank you for, for spending two hours on the dot, actually. It's literally just yeah. ticked over to two hours and one minute. And uh, this this has been, out of out of all three, this has been, like, the best one thus far. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking that, like, we should, we should just talk music, you know, once every three months or something like that and just talk. Oh, man. Talk all sorts I of love shit. Knowledge, your knowledge is great, and uh, yeah, I mean, any because I mean, the thing is with me is that because I don't know, I, I kind of I don't retain all of this information. I just kind of like bulldoze my way forward, so I'm trying to find like what what what, what do I want to do next? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Where you go? Yeah, yeah. I've got to show you one of these because I've got I've got two of these right, and right. you wouldn't. You will not believe these beauties. Okay. The, but, but you have two are, of these. These are currently my favorite guitars. Right now. Okay. Oh, now, th that's, that's, the, uh, that's a lawsuit era, is it? Ah, no, no, it's, this is a, quite a new one. Is it? But what the, the thing is with these, right, mm -hmm. 24 frets. Ah, look at that, 24 frets. When Ibanez bring these out, they only have these three knobs. Yeah. But of course, if like me, you cannot handle looking at a Gibson Les Paul with three knobs. I cannot. <laughs> so I had that one installed, so it's got, you know, yeah, volume. It's, it's got the volume Yeah. It's how it should be. It's how it should be. And with Dimasio's in, this thing is just such this because my other guitarist he plays you know a, a Les Paul standard, mm -hmm. and this just complements. It makes the sound because you see, I need them twenty four frets. You know? Yeah, yeah, because you're you're a shredding dude. <laughs> I've been playing them since I was like thirteen years old when yeah. I bought that Ibanez with twenty four frets. Yeah, because yeah, that that Ibanez that that thing does have twenty four frets, right? They were making them back in the day. In this thing, which I picked this up recently because I've always wanted one. It's an artist. Yeah, yeah. And it's if you take a look at that serial number, if you can see it, it's nineteen seventy seven. Yeah, yeah. And they they were making beautiful guitars back then. Are they Grover tuners? No, but they they look no, like they are. This one is. Yeah, yeah. And the, these are Grover tuners too. Oh yeah, I mean they're my favourite tuners. Yeah. They, they hold, and, they hold, they're like rock solid. Yeah. Now these Ibanez ones are basically copying grooves. Yes, yeah. they're very. Yeah. They're very. Yeah, but they're still good. That's <laughs> no, so good. Stay in uh, touch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you, and have the best night. Cheers, Nate. Take care. Keep your pecker up. <laughs> Will do. Cheers, mate. Cheers for now. <laughs>